Can you hear me okay? Do you think I could trouble someone for a glass of water, please? Thanks, Leslie. <coughs> well, now, this is uh, our third um, look at the glorious subjects of the, the new covenant. And I want to make this clear again. God always deals with us by way of covenant. That's the way he deals with men and women, always, inevitably, right through the scriptures. And we've seen how God entered into covenants with individuals, with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, last time I spoke, we looked at how now God enters into a covenant with a people group, with Israel. But first of all, he has to deal with their enemies, their cruel enemies, the Egyptians. And you remember that final plague, the death of the firstborn, and then they cross over the Red Sea, and they see their enemies destroyed, because, because before God can enter into a covenant, thank you, Leslie, thank you very much, uh, he must first deal with our enemy. Now, has God dealt with your enemy for you? Has he dealt with your enemy? Um, because no man can serve two masters. And then you remember they go to Sinai and uh, Moses receives the law and it's read to the children of Israel and they say yes. They make their vows together. And uh, you'll find there the constituent parts of a wedding, a marriage. They make their vows together. Then 70 of the elders plus Moses and Aaron's sons go up the mountain and God prepares them a great banquet. There's a reception. And then, and then God says, now I'm coming to live with you. Make me a special tent where I can come and live with you. So all those are the constituent parts of a marriage because God married Israel. Hallelujah. And I want to repeat again, the goal of history is a marriage. Praise God. Now fast forward 1,500 years and it's Passover time when they're celebrating what happened during during the time of their deliverance from Israel. And then you read this in Matthew 26. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And many of you will know that Jesus was drawing on an analogy of a wedding, a Jewish wedding. Um, and, and some of you know these things. The bridegroom would leave his father's house and visit the house of the girl that he wanted to marry. Jesus left his father's house in order to come to earth because he wants to marry us. And um, the young man would negotiate a price for the bride, the bride price. The cost of the bride price in Jesus' case was his life, was the very shedding of his own blood. That was the enormous price. Now, when the young man had agreed the terms with the young woman, he would raise a cup. He would pour out some wine from a skin into a cup, and he would raise the cup and say, well, are we in agreement? And the covenant was entered into. Now, Jesus has the cup in his hand. You know what he's doing? He's proposing. Hallelujah. He's proposing that he should be betrothed to his church. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that wonderful? 
because the goal of history is a marriage. Now, Jesus has the cup in his hand, and he, he's, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hallelujah. Now, that's what we've done this morning. Uh, uh, Stuart referred to it. We've exchanged vows. That's what we've done. And this is glorious. <clears throat> and the man would go back and say, I'm now going to prepare a place for you. And he would often go back to his father's house and prepare an extension on it for his bride. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you are also. Now, will you turn to Titus chapter 1, please? And just one verse, a remarkable verse. Titus, that little book. And you let me tell you this. After my years in church, sometimes I struggle to find books. <laughs> Never worry about that. Sometimes your mind goes blank, especially some of those small minor prophets. So don't worry if you struggle. It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter about anyone else. You just find it and don't worry about it. If you can't find it, don't worry about it. But there's a remarkable vo verse here in verse 2. Listen, watch this. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began. Now my question to you is to whom did he promise it? Seems to me a perfectly reasonable question. It was before time began that this promise was made. Well, now God is accommodating his language to our finite minds and telling us that this plan of redemption was an eternal one that went back before time began. A covenant took place in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See what I mean? God's always dealing by covenant. Before there was a world, before there were stars, before anything was created, a promise was made, a covenant was entered into between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I think it is. God was not prepared to leave his beloved creatures to the devil and lose them to the powers of hell. So Jesus would covenant with the Father. This is what Jesus agreed to do. I'm going to leave heaven's glory. I agree to be born of a virgin. To take upon myself the form of a servant. To preach good tidings to the meek. To bind up the brokenhearted. To open prison doors. I agree to endure all the reproaches that are ahead of me. I agree to be called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You remember that verse in Isaiah 53? He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. He would submit himself. This is the promise now he's making. This is the covenant he's making. And this is the covenant you and I are going to be taken into. And he agreed to submit himself to wicked men and lay down his own life. He would bear all the wrath of God for your sin and mine. And he would send the Holy Spirit to carry on the work. And the Father covenanted with the Son to give him a bride. You see, God wants children and a bride for his Son. Promised to give him a bride and, 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 and uh, a people as countless beyond the stars that Abraham was able to see. They'd be washed. They'd be made clean. They'd be the subject of his love. They'd be the subject of his adoption. 
the Father would adopt them and be the objects of his eternal love. And the Holy Spirit, this is the promise before time began I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit would awaken the hearts of men and women. I hope he's awakening your heart this morning. He's awakening my heart to these truths. Even if you've heard them before. Or if you've never heard them for the first time. The Holy Spirit will awaken our thoughts and our hearts. And he agreed he would awaken the hearts of those who are unsaved to realize that they're sinners. And show them the need of redemption. And work in them and keep their faith alive. Listen, before there was sin, there was a Savior. And all that Jesus did on the earth was in fulfillment of that agreement. And we must keep that in mind. That's why in John 12 he says, For I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Hallelujah. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. It, this was his consuming work to carry out the promise that was made before time began. Sometimes we call it the eternal covenant. And if you read John 17 in the light of this, it comes to life. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I've done what you, we agreed to do, Father. I've done it. I've finished the work that you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus for carrying out this eternal covenant. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now I am no longer in the world, he says. Uh -huh. He's now thinking of us. But these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one. Father, this was our covenant. This was our agreement. Now please bring them into this covenant. Let the promises be theirs as well. Hallelujah. That's the new covenant. Now, you remember, let's just go back to Genesis 15. You don't need to turn to it. Abraham was childless. And God came with a covenant. Here you are again, you see. Look, he says, toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them so shall thy seed be and then you've got this glorious thing where Abraham said yes I believe that God and God accounted it to him for righteousness things are still the same by the way you, you do realize you're sons and daughters of Abraham, don't you? Father Abraham, we used to sing, the children had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. That's true. That covenant still is with us. I am one of them and so are you, you know, all that. So let's all praise the Lord, clap hands, stamp feet, whatever we used to do, run around. Now, something is about to happen on earth which will enact that eternal promise made on he in heaven. God instructs Abraham to prepare for the making of a covenant. And now in those days, there was a corridor of dead animals cut in half. And um, the usual practice was to walk through that corridor of death. 
And the two people would make an agreement, a covenant. And if I break that covenant, may it be to me like these animals are. It was a corridor of death. Now Abraham prepared the site, you remember? He waited all day. He shooed off the, the birds. And then God put him into a sleep. Oh, this is glorious stuff. You see, do you remember someone else that was put into a sleep? Do you remember Adam? Why? Because God was going to have for Adam a bride. And Adam, as he slept, not just in some kind of shallow way, but in a deep way, God takes the woman out of him, takes the rib out of him and makes a woman. And he's going to do the same here now. Uh, because <clears throat> God was going to take hold of something. He was going to take hold of the seed of Abraham. Now you know who the seed of Abraham is, do you? Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, uh, and this is an enactment in a sense, because two parties enter this covenant, this, this corridor, but Abraham is not one of them. And, and the two parties are symbolized by a smoking furnace and a flaming sword. This is God. Hallelujah. This is God enacting the covenant that was made in heaven. The smoking furnace. Now listen, be ever so careful that you don't just tell people God loves them. Be ever so careful. I'll come on to that in a moment. Our God is a consuming fire. as well as a flaming sword. This is God enacting something that happened before time began and this covenant is now being entered into. This is God walking between the pieces and he makes this unilateral promise and he binds himself and he fulfills himself to that covenant and that Abrahamic covenant has never been set aside. Hallelujah. And when you come to Christ, I repeat, you come into that promise that was made to Abraham. Hence, Father Abraham had many sons. Now, here's my question. And it's a question that's posed in the Bible, so it's good for us to ask. Why then was that covenant later taken place? Why did that covenant take place at Sinai? What was all that about? Galatians chapter 3 for you Bible students deals with this. If salvation is by faith and not by works, not by keeping the law, why did God give the law? And in Stuart's prayer this morning, he gave us the answer in a pretty forceful way. Did anyone hear it? I did. Why? Why wait 1,500 years? Why didn't Jesus just come at that point when Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness? Well then, says Paul, why were the laws given? They were added. Ah, now we've got a clue. They were added after the promise was given to show men how guilty they are of breaking God's laws. But this system of law was to last only until the coming of Christ, the child to whom the promise was made. You see, this great promise to Abraham was a covenant of blessing. It was a promise of salvation. God would bring to Abraham and his descendants salvation. It was a covenant of life as opposed to the law, which is death. That's what Stuart said this morning, wasn't it? He, some, he said something like this, we can't keep it. We can't keep it. Try as we might, we can't keep it. Well then, says Paul in Galatians 3, are God's laws... And God's promises against each other? Of course not. If we could be saved by his laws, 
then God would not have had to give us a different way to get out of the grip of sin. For the Scriptures insist we are all its prisoners. The only way out is through faith in Jesus Christ. The way of escape is open to all who believe Him. Listen, says Paul, the law cannot bring life. Have you got that? Haven't you proved it in your life? Faith is emphasized in Abraham. Repentance is emphasized in Moses. That's why, that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And it was added, this law was added until Jesus came. Because he was the fulfillment of it all. He fulfilled it completely. In fact, Paul says, Christ is the end of the law. Hallelujah. When, when, when he came, all the ceremonies disappeared. They all, the veil of the temple was rent, ripped from top to bottom. They say it was five inches thick. The no entry sign went. So every man and every woman could go in. In and through the name of Jesus Christ. No more day of atonement. No Passover. It was replaced by this this morning. No priesthood. The priesthood was over in that form. So what place has the law now for us? Because it has a place. Because although all those ceremonies have gone, all those rituals have gone, God's moral standards have not changed one iota. And now we've got the benefit of them, not just in the Old Testament, but they're written down for us also in the New Testament. So what's the purpose of the law? It teaches us that we are sinful. Have you come to the conclusion that you're sinful? I read a quote this week from an old preacher who said, no man or woman who doesn't think they deserve hell will be in heaven. I like that. Have you come to that conclusion? That you deserve hell? Praise God. Now we know, says Paul in Romans 3, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under law, that every mouth may be stopped. Wow! I've got nothing more to say. I see the condition of my life. I see the condition of my heart. I understand that I've broken God's law and if I break one of them, I break all of them. It's like a mirror. I look at myself in a mirror and I see how awfully ugly I am. Have you come to that place? Or is someone trying to raise your self-esteem? Well, there's a place for that at times. But not with the gospel. We're cursed by the law. And praise God, he became a curse for us. It makes us feel guilty. The word we were talking about this the other day, Eddie and I, pedagogus. Paid meaning child. Agogus meaning leader. Wealthy families had people to look after their children and ensure they got to school. A pedagogus. And they didn't play truant. And they made sure they got to school. The law is the pedagogus to bring us to Christ. That's why when the gospel is preached, the law has to be spoken of. Bit of silence there. Wesley said, preach 95% law and 5% grace. So did Whitfield. And when people came through to Christ in those days, they came through. They weren't mushroom Christians up one day and down the next. People have to understand that they have broken the law of God, which is the point of the Holy Ghost bringing that conviction. 
The Holy Ghost doesn't come and say, what a wonderful person you are. God loves you. you ju- he thinks you're absolutely wonderful. You're brilliant. You're... No, he brings that conviction of sin. And when you realize what God has done, then you are aware of the love of God. And not until. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, the culture that we now live in is postmodern. We talked about this briefly a few weeks ago. Postmodern, postmodernism is, most modernism is there is no absolute truth. That's the day in which we're living. There's no absolute truth. And, and, and moral relativism, there's no authority. There's no standard. There's no one to whom to be accountable. What's good for you is okay. That what's good for me is all right. And then you've got atheism, humanistic atheism. No rules. No judge. That's where we are. In our in our uh, culture today. No truth, no authority, no rules, no judge. And brothers and sisters, our responsibility, if we're going to be faithful gospel preachers, is don't just simply tell people God loves you. Otherwise, you will not tell them the truth. That's not enough. In fact, let me suggest to you that sometimes that's quite dangerous. I think if you simply talk about the love of God to people, you're doing them a grave, grave disservice. He wants to fix your life. He wants to give you a nice future. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the way Paul spoke. Incidentally, you won't read about the love of God in the Acts of the Apostles at all. Check it out. You won't find a single preacher in the Bible who starts with the love of God. Not one. Listen to Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. See, Paul doesn't say, smile, God has a wonderful plan for your life. I hope I'm not upsetting you. If I am, I don't care, actually. I don't, because I'm as sure about this as anything. We have to tell the truth to people. There has to come a point where people come under the conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit that drives them to Christ. They don't sign a card to say they've done something or they've said a sinner's prayer or something like that. It's more than that. It's entering into an eternal covenant with God. Well, now you say, well, what about John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Well, for God so loved the world, he agapied the world. That's what it says, all right? Now, we know there's more than three words in the Greek for love. One is eros. Uh, Most of our love songs are written about that. It's almost something you can't help. And uh, it's a selfish love. You fall in and out of this. That's not the way that God loved the world. Or there's um, philia. That's the love of affection. It's really like saying, I like him or I like her. But the love that's mentioned in John 3.16, 
is agape love. It's centered in the will. It's not centered in the heart or in the mind, essentially. It's centered in the will. God so loved the world that he gave. Praise God. This is the love of God. It's much better. It's much better than eros love or filia love. It's much better than that. It's a love, that's, it's a love that goes out and sees a need. It's the same love that the Good Samaritan showed. You remember? Same love. Now you keep telling people that God loves them and they'll start to think, oh, I must be really nice. Oh, I must be really attractive. Really? My friend, we're the enemies of God. We're the enemies of God. Oh, I know this. I know you can combine these things and God has compassion on us. God does love us. But let's tell them the truth. Let's tell them the truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God does not love with unconditional love whatever someone might say. That's another heresy of the day. God's love is not unconditional at all. If it were, there would be no hell. Are you saved? Would you say you deserve to go to hell? Have you come to a point in your life when you've decided and realized that you're a hopeless case? Have you despaired of yourself? Are you like that woman in Romans 7 that keeps coming home to Mr. Law and he keeps on going on at her and she can't do it? But she sees Jesus. She wants to marry him because he says, I'll come and do it in you. Have you come to that point? If you haven't, come to it this morning, I beg of you in Jesus' name. Come this morning and realize that God really does love you not with some fleeting in and out of love, not with some mere friendship, but he loves you so much. He left heaven's glory to marry you. He's paid the price. He's paid the bride price with his own blood. He's gone back and he says, now I'm coming back for you. I don't know when that'll be. In spite of all the speculation we have, who knows? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I pray that we might be faithful in preaching this gospel. I pray, Lord, that we might preach the whole counsel of God. I pray that you'll give us wisdom, Lord. <clears throat> I pray that you'll give us opportunity. That, Lord, you will bring that conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment. Lord, we see how you, right at the beginning of your ministry, went out and said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord, we want to live in the reality of our day in this postmodern society, Lord. Bring to men's attention that there is a judge. There is a law that has been broken. There is a God. There is a Savior. And we pray that many will turn, Lord, in these days to you. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.